Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker. Some people are married to more than one person in a lifetime. Many married people have several children, at least a half a dozen dogs in a lifetime. Some people are fortunate enough to have several important people in their lives. I've been told you only need a few real friends. But when you view life from a hearse, I have learned you need at least six, an able-bodied six at that, unless you plan to be cremated, and then you don't need any, I suppose. But you only have one mama and one daddy. Although we all have those or we would not be here, I understand clearly that not all people have had the positive experience I've had in the parents department. There's probably nothing you can do about that except one thing. There's a really good chance you can make it much different and much better when you leave here for the children in your life and for other people who have been entrusted to you. I know I had nothing to do with choosing my parents. Nobody even asked my opinion on who they should be. God did that. And the older I get, the more I know that when God chose my parents, he extended his grace on me. They were something else. They were not perfect. I promise you that. But I've learned when someone close to you dies, who you loved very much, they become perfect in your mind. When you look back, you're just going to mainly remember the good stuff. God has a way of doing that, I think. I've noticed that starts at the funeral. We could be having a funeral for the biggest scoundrel in town, but I've noticed those at the podium don't ever talk about the scoundrel he was. They just try to talk about the good stuff. If they don't know any good stuff, they'll just make it up. And that's a good thing. So in the next few minutes, you will get only the good stuff about my parents. I'm sure I could come up with a few of their shortcomings if I tried, but it would be difficult. I'll go with easy. As I look back, my mom and daddy were a perfect couple in my mind, but in many ways they were complete opposites. For example, I remember them leaving me at the University of Georgia in the fall of 1972 where I entered as a freshman. Those were the days of hippies. And the hippies were having a big concert in the quadrangle right outside my dorm. You could smell marijuana in the air. After helping me unload my stuff and when they started to leave, Mama tearfully gave me a little going away speech. She told me such things as find a good church, hang around Christian people, and she told me she'd be praying for me every day. And she was telling the truth about that. I knew she would, and I know she did. Daddy, on the other hand, gave a really short speech. He shook my hand, looked me in the eye, and said, Give them hell, son. And I did. When I was in upper elementary school, there was a boy that was bullying me. I told my parents over our evening meal, which we always had, by the way, all sitting at the table together, Mama told me to go to the teacher the next morning and tell them what was going on. The teacher would tell the principal, and the bully would be disciplined accordingly. And further, she said, if I didn't tell, she would go tell him. Daddy's advice was different. He told me tomorrow, as soon as the bullying starts, to not say a word to him, but turn around and hit him as hard as you can right between his eyes with your fist. I took Daddy's advice on that. I got in trouble for doing it, but the boy never bullied me again. In fact, we became friends. I'm not telling you to advise your kids to do such a thing this day and time. The consequences would be much worse. But it was pretty good advice 55 years ago. When I ordered a nudist colony magazine at 12 years old, I read that it would come in a plain brown wrapping so that no one would ever know what it was. Maybe it did or maybe it didn't. But Blanche, the local postmaster, did not have any trouble figuring out what it was. In fact, she personally brought it to the house and walked in with it 
and handed it to my mama. That was a big deal. Trust me, I got in big trouble. Regretfully, I never got to see the magazine I ordered until a few months later when I found it in the bottom drawer of my daddy's desk. In fact, he was so intrigued that a few years later, he drove up to the front gate at a nudist colony in Florida while on a trip with my mom, my elderly grandmother, and an elderly female cousin in tow. Mama Mabel, my grandmother, did not like it one bit. She covered her eyes and said, I am not looking. Anita, my grandfather's cousin, immediately replied, I am going to look. I would have looked too. When Daddy asked the man at the gate why he was wearing clothes, his response was funny. We're nudists, not idiots. It's 45 degrees out here. They never got to look. My mama was a down-on-your-knees praying mama. I have a vivid mental picture of seeing her in the living room, reading her very worn Bible, or on her knees praying. I have no doubt her prayers protected me and probably saved my life during my crazy college years. Daddy, on the other hand, taught me how to make a living. He required me to work from an early age and took me with him where kids probably didn't need to be. I watched him walk in some of the most difficult situations in life where someone he had known all his life had lost a mother, a father, or a child. I noticed their heads would lift up when he walked in the room. They were grateful he was there, and they felt somehow things would be better because he was. They knew he was a professional and a man of great integrity. He was so very good at what he did, simply the best of the best. As a young boy, I knew I wanted to follow in my daddy's footsteps. I knew when I went to the University of Georgia, I would enter mortuary school after I graduated. I never wavered from that. Daddy could have no idea what he taught me would take me to the places it did. He could not have even imagined it. I learned everything I needed to know about the funeral business, watching and listening to him. I would eventually get to share that knowledge with a whole lot of folks. I also had a strong desire to follow my mama's footsteps. I learned to love God and to seek the truth of God's Word from her. I read it and even memorized chunks of it, and my faith became the most important part of my life. And I was given a stage to share and spread that truth. She would have also been amazed and very proud. Not that either of my parents were one-dimensional people. People that knew them certainly know that. I have memories of Daddy working hard, studying the Bible to teach Sunday school or getting his thoughts together to speak at a church lay event. And I remember Mama laughing and carrying on foolishness. But I know what I got from each. Mama, the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of the first settlers and founders of Fort Myers, Florida, came to Georgia from there. Before the war, Daddy was working in Fort Myers for a brief time. My future mama was working at the Fort Myers News Press. They were running a daily ad with a picture of a beautiful girl named Naya Gonzalez soliciting readers to come see Naya to take out a classified ad in their paper. Daddy kept seeing Naya's picture in the paper. He decided to stop by the news press to take out an ad. The ad? He placed an ad asking her for a date. Thank God she accepted much to the surprise and anguish of Naya's mother, Mabel, Ed and Naya Gata were married only a few months later. Mama Mabel was a serious-minded lady. She was a staunch Presbyterian, but was also as tough as you can get. Her husband had died suddenly at 39 years of age when her two kids were small, and she never remarried. So I suppose she had to be tough. She thought the word pregnant was a curse word and later in life claimed to us grandchildren that she had never seen herself naked. I have a great Mama Mabel story I will share another day. For now, just know carrying on foolishness of any kind was not in her DNA, not even a little bit. Now this large, muscular, stranger, and jokester of a man from Georgia took her daughter from South Florida and moved her to Middle Georgia. And soon he left her there with a baby who was born 10 months after they married when he entered the U.S. Navy to go fight a war on the other side of the world. Mama Mabel was not a happy camper, but that changed over the years. 
she ended up worshiping the ground my dad walked on. Daddy was the most serious and professional man you would ever meet at the funeral home. He took his life's calling very seriously. His reputation in that business was above reproach. But outside of the funeral home, he was always carrying on foolishness. Besides the funeral home, he also owned and operated a store, one that sold everything from Evinrude Motors to Hook Cheese. And until 1961, the funeral home was behind the meat market at that store. The business was started by his grandfather in 1866. Boy, I've told that story a few times. Back in 1866, that's a long time ago, 140 years ago, my great-granddaddy moved from Macon, Georgia to Reynolds, Georgia to start a business. Now, he did that because he thought Reynolds was on the verge of becoming a booming city. <laughs> you got to understand, there were 1,200 people that lived in Reynolds in 1866. And there's still 1,200 people that live there. <laughs> but it became my lot in life to work in this family business that my great-granddaddy started way before my time. As in most family businesses, my, my great-granddaddy started it. My granddaddy came and worked with my great-granddaddy way before I was ever thought of. A lot of years after that, my dad came on the scene and worked with my granddaddy. Again, my great-granddaddy died by then, but my dad and granddaddy were working together. Then a lot of years after that, I came on the scene and I worked with my daddy and my granddaddy in this general store in Reynolds, Georgia. Their motto, when I was growing up working in this store, and it was literally written on their checks, but their motto was that we sell everything from Evan Rude Motors to Hook Cheese. Trust me, they did. Daddy was the Browning gun dealer. Y'all know about Browning guns, right? He was a Wilson Sporting Goods dealer. He was a GE appliance dealer. He sold the first television ever sold in the county. He went to school and learned how to work on them. He dug wells. He put the pumps in. He sold insurance. He'd give you a little assurance if you need it. <laughs> he sold groceries, he sold meats, he sold Evan Rude Motors, and he sold hooked cheese. I remember as a kid working in that store, a lady would come in and she'd get her grocery buggy. And the first stop would be the produce counter. That's normal, right? You go in a store that sells among everything else. Groceries, you go to the produce counter first. The next stop was the frozen food counter. Never forget what happened there one day. I was a kid, and I didn't realize that the pictures I was seeing would help form me later on in life. I guess because of who he was, Daddy could get by with most anything. He lived at the right time because most of his antics would not go over very well today. Like the time he got the preacher's wife mixed up with a startled stranger. But let, let me tell you something about my, my dad. I probably need to say this right here because, you know, it make, make a little bit more sense. But he couldn't get by with this now, but he lived at the right time. But Daddy used to love to hug and kiss all the ladies. <laughs> Y'all don't look at me funny. He wasn't a pervert or anything. Everybody loved Daddy, but he was always hugging the ladies, kissed them on the cheek, called them sugar or sweetie, and he got by with that. We had a Methodist preacher that had moved into town. And he was young and had a cute wife. And Daddy was always hugging her on her, kissing on the cheek, calling her sugar or sweetie or whatever. But this lady was bent over the frozen food counter one day trying to pick out a frozen food. And Daddy walked by in his normal kind of fashion, kind of pat on the rear end. We walked by and said, how you doing, sweetie? Well, this lady like to turn the counter over him. She jumped up, turned around. It was a complete stranger. Daddy said, Lord, have mercy, lady. Excuse me. I thought you were the preacher's wife. <laughs> that lady got out of there. I don't know who she was. She was passing through town trying to buy some ice cream. That woman didn't buy nothing. I tell you what, she left. As I mentioned, the funeral home was behind the meat market. You could order your roast and then go behind the counter and view your deceased friend and sign the register book. Lots of interesting conversations took place in front of that meat market. Now this is one of those old fashioned meat markets. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you probably won't have a clue. But you know, today you go into stores, they've already wrapped the meat, they've named it, they've packaged it, they've priced it, you pick out what you want and you go pay for it. But this is one of those meat markets that you ordered what you wanted. If you wanted two pounds of hamburger meat, you tell the butcher, take that meat right there and take that meat right there and go combine it together and go back and grind it for me. I remember I was standing in front of that meat market one day and and uh, there was a lady standing there, and she had a chicken fryer in her hand. And she had one hand on one leg and one hand on the other leg, and she had the chicken right up to her nose. And she was checking out the chicken. <laughs> and my daddy walked by, and he looked back and said, Francis, what in the world are you doing? She said, Ed, I'm checking this chicken. I'm smelling it to be sure it's fresh. He walked back, and he looked back and said, Francis, you know, I just thinking, uh, you think uh, you, you could pass that test? <laughs> Our next door neighbors were the Watleys. Dr. Watley, who was one of two doctors in our town, and my dad were close friends. 
they both laughed at this story until the day they died. I got to tell you, before I was, I was a very young kid. I guess I was probably 13 or 14. I went with my daddy on a death call one night and I can't remember. I know it's two sisters and one of them had died. They lived together. I think they were widows. They may have been uh, old maids. I'm not sure, but but back in those days, t today when somebody dies at home, either hospice pronounces them dead or, or a coroner is there or whatever. But in those days, either Dr. Watley or Dr. Sams was always at the house. When, when, when we made a death call, they were there. And when we got there, when the funeral home got there, they would, wh wh whichever one was there would leave. But I'll never forget this night. I went with Daddy, and I remember him talking to the sister of the sister who died. And Daddy said all the right things. He was very good at that. And he said, made her feel so good. And, and Dr. Sams had told everybody bye, and he had gone. And, and we took, put her on the stretch and put in the hearse. And we were driving off real slow. I'm about 14 years old. And all of a sudden, somebody knocks on the window of the hearse, and it scared me to death. And I mean, it startled me, and it was the sister. And she said, would you please, let me, Ed, I want to tell you something. He said, something's bothering me. She said, he said, tell me what, whatever you want. So I, I know Dr. Sams is a fine doctor. I mean, I've got all the confidence in the world. He's a great doctor. But Dr. Watley was my sister's doctor. And I really would feel better if you let Dr. Watley see my sister to be sure she's dead before you take her to the funeral home and start that whole process. Daddy said, that is no problem. I'd be glad to do that. Dr. Watley lived next door to, to, to Daddy. And so we, ended up, we pulled up at the hearse about 3 o'clock in the morning. We pulled up in the hearse rang the doorbell. You got to understand back in those days, that was not unusual because we took sick people in the hearses. I mean, you know, we, we ran the ambulance service too. So it was not unusual to take a sick person to Dr. Watley's house and let him check him out. Three o'clock in the morning, daddy rang the doorbell. He, Dr. Watley's name was Ed Watley and daddy's name was Ed Goddard, both named Ed. But Dr. Watley came to the door and daddy said, Ed, I got somebody I want you to check. He said, give me just a minute. And Dr. Watley put his britches over his pajamas, grabbed his stethoscope, got his little black bag and Hurried out there and jumped in the back of the hearse. Daddy was standing out there with his arms crossed, waiting on him. Dr. Wally had been there a few minutes. All of a sudden, he stuck his head out of the hearse. He said, Ed, this lady's dead. <laughs> Daddy said, that's all I wanted to know. There are so many stories. I certainly look forward to sharing with you and bringing in a few well-rounded funeral directors with a sense of humor from across the country to share a few of their stories. I know a few of those kind of folks. When you view life from a hearse, you learn it is a healthy thing to lighten up and look for the lighter side. I definitely got that from my dad. My mom and daddy had been married for 52 years when they died. They truly loved each other. But when I think about it, I believe mama kind of just put up with dad's foolishness, kind of like my wife does me. My parents were complete opposites, but together they were one powerful team and they were fully involved in their children's lives. Their involvement and investment in our lives was their greatest gift to us. And your involvement and investment in the people God has entrusted to you will be the greatest gift you leave. For years, I ended every speech expanding on that thought. If you don't hear anything else I say, you listen to what I'm fixing to tell you, you listen to this country undertaker because I'm fixing to tell you the truth. The only investments you make in this life that will be here after you're dead and gone and some crazy guy like me buries you are the investments you make in people. Write it down. Nothing wrong with making money. I understand about making money. That is a different topic and it's an important topic. It's for another speaker, but I'll tell you this. If your chief focus in life is to see how much money you can make and to see how many things you can accumulate, you will get to the end of your life and you'll realize that you missed the boat. I don't think I've ever seen a family leave that scene at a cemetery, get in that car, look back at those tents and say, boy, I wish daddy would have spent more time at the office. You don't hear that. You know what you hear? You know what you hear? I wish I had five more minutes with daddy. Or I wish I had five more minutes with mom. I got to tell y'all, I wish I had five more minutes with daddy and five more minutes with Mama. <clears throat> I used to play basketball, I told you that, and it used to amaze me that Mama would follow that bus. And wherever I was playing, I don't care where we were, when that team walked in that gym, Mama would be walking in right behind it. I don't ever remember her missing the basketball game. I'm sure she did, but I forgot. What was more amazing than that, and sometimes it would happen after we had started playing, but I would look up and I'd see my daddy walk in that gym. 
And you know, Daddy was usually had on a black suit. He was a tall man, had white hair. And I was thinking, he's traveled a long way to a basketball game. Daddy must love basketball. You know, I got a little older, got married, started having kids of my own. I realized it wasn't basketball he was so interested in. What he was interested in was those people that God had entrusted to him. And he spent his life investing his life in those people. My mama was a special lady. I got to tell y'all, I loved my mom. When she was dying at the medical center in Macon, Georgia, I got two brothers and a sister. We would gather around that bed. Our wives were there. My sister's husband were there, was there. We went three or four days watching her gasp for breath. We thought every breath would be a last. Some of y'all have been through that. It's not fun watching somebody you love go through that process. But after a couple of days of watching that, truth is we were praying that every breath would be a last so she could just go home. But early one morning after a couple of days of that, she kind of woke up. And she called my name. And I'm the youngest of four kids, but I'm a big old boy. I was getting people out of the way because I want to try to hear what Mama's trying to say. I had a strong feeling it be the last thing she ever told me. And I tried, I had to get my ear right over her dry parched lips, but I heard her. You're not going to believe what she told me. Last thing Mama ever told me on the face of this earth. She said, the Braves won last night. <laughs> I thought, the Braves won last night? So Mama, who in the world gives a rip right now if the Braves won? I got to tell you, I did ask her what the score was while I was standing there. But you know, I, I, got, I got to think about that later. My mama was the biggest Atlanta Braves fan you would ever meet in your life. In 1969, for you real Braves fans, when the Braves won the Western Division for the first time, mama got in her car at midnight and drove up and down the streets of Reynolds honking the horn. <laughs> and she was a Braves fan. I went to the University of Georgia, and mama didn't know a football from a tennis ball. And she became the biggest Georgia Bulldog fan you'd ever meet in your life. You know what the truth is? That the last thing she told me is very important to me today. Because her whole life was wrapped up in those people that God had entrusted to her. And she became the biggest Braves fan you'd ever meet in your life. And she became the biggest Georgia Bulldog fan you'd ever meet in your life. Because that's what her kids were doing. You know, I didn't say it then. I thought it later. Mom, I don't know if the Braves won. But you won. And she did. Read a book several years ago. And it was a quote. I give this quote everywhere I go. I don't even know who wrote the book or who, who, who I'm quoting. But he said this. He said, Pictures have a way of changing you far more profoundly and far more permanently than words ever could. Pictures change. I remember my first grade teacher. Do y'all? I mean, your teacher. You don't have to remember mine already. <laughs> but Miss Verna was my teacher, and she had a profound impact on me and a lot of other people who came through that first grade. I loved Miss Verna, and so did a lot of other folks. But you know what the truth is? And folks, I'm not stupid. I've sat down and tried to think about it. I don't remember a word the woman ever said. I don't remember what she said, but I should remember what she did. And I remember the way she made me feel. I can name all every one of my Sunday school teachers. They took us to bowling alleys, to pizza parlors, to ice cream parlors. They taught us Sunday after Sunday. When I had, they had Sunday school, I was there. But I got to be honest. And folks, I ain't stupid. And I sat down and tried to think about it. I don't remember a lesson they taught. I know I picked up principles along the way, but the truth is I don't remember what they said. But I should remember what they did. And I remember the way they made me feel. Can I tell you something? I told you I was an undertaker. I was going to tell you the truth. We got the words down pat. We got that. We know what to say to our neighbor who's in trouble. We know what to say to our kid, our grandkid, to pat him on the rear end, to send him on the way. We do good with the talking. We can handle that. But I want to tell you this. Those people that God has entrusted to you, they're really not going to remember a whole lot of what you said when they're gone from here. I work with my daddy every day of my life. And I got to tell you, I remember some of what he said but I got a whole lot more pictures of what he did. Can I tell you daddies and granddaddies something? Again, I'm not a preacher, I'm an undertaker, but there's not a more biblical thing you can do than to go outside and throw that ball with that little boy, or go to that little league game, or that soccer game, or that fishing hole, or for you mamas and the grandmamas to take that little girl or boy and teach them how to balance a checkbook, or take them to the mall, or, or what, teach them how to make a lemon pie, whatever you do, those things gonna live long after you're dead and gone. All the speeches, they ain't gonna remember. And that's true. One more thing I'm worried about, and I'm going to quit. I hadn't met anybody yet that did it right all the time. I get to meet a lot of people, and I meet people that want everybody to think they do it right all the time, but I figured this much out with my gray hair. We're all human beings, and we mess up. And we do things that we regret. And sometimes we live in the full-blown consequences of what we did, and sometimes we think we get by, and maybe we do. I don't understand all that. But the truth is... We're human beings and we mess up. And I'm afraid that we spend too much time worrying about 
how we blew it 20 years ago or 10 years ago or last week or yesterday. Or maybe we're even worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, next week or next month down the road that we missed the moment. Can I tell y'all something? I told y'all I was an undertaker. I was going to tell you the truth. That's all we got. We got that. We've got this moment. And everybody in this room has been entrusted with people. By the way, nobody's exempt from that. For some, it's your mate. For some, it's your children, your grandchildren. For some, it's your, your civic club, your church group, your neighborhood, the people you work for, the people that work for you, the people you work with. Everybody's been entrusted with people. And all you have is this moment. Gloria Gaither said it like this. She said, hold tight to the sound of the music of living. Happy songs from the laughter of children at play. Hold my hand as we run through the sweet, fragrant meadows, making memories of what was today. Tiny voice that I hear is my little boy calling for daddy to hear just what he has to say or your little girl standing there by the hillside may never be quite like today. Tender words, gentle touch, <laughs> and a good cup of coffee, and someone who loves me and wants me to stay, hold them near while they're here. Don't wish for tomorrow to look back and wish for today. Take the blue of the sky, the green of the forest, and the gold and the brown of freshly mown hay. Add the pale shades of spring and the circus of autumn and weave you a lovely today. We have this moment to hold in our hands and to touch as it slips through our fingers like sand. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow may never come. But we have this moment today. God bless you. Thank you very much. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker.